This video is, rather appropriately, brought to you by Bright Sellers. Bright Sellers send your wine, and that's awesome enough, but better than that, they introduce you to new wines that you will probably love. And look, I'm a pretty big fan of wine, and I like discovering new wines to drink and enjoy. What makes Bright Sellers quite so clever is that they maximize the chances that you're going to love the wine that they send you. You take a super short, no snobbery survey about what sort of wine you like, and they send you a box of wine based on those preferences. And it's also a guarantee you'll like them, because if you don't like it, they'll ship you another bottle with your next delivery so you can't really lose. What else? Well, you can choose how much they send, and of course, it's delivered to wherever you want it to go, making everything super easy. Plus, each box comes with wine education cards, so you can learn just a little bit about what you're drinking. Bryce Sellers is giving you guys 50% off your first six bottle box. Follow the link to take the quiz and get started. Just click the link in the description below. And let's get into the video. As you might expect, given one of Jesus' most well-known acts was providing a ton of wine for a party and then later at a much more momentous dinner commanding his disciples to drink the stuff in remembrance of him, during most of Christian history leading all the way up to the 19th century, while there were exceptions, Catholics, Protestants, and even Puritans generally taught that wine was a gift from God and was created by God to be used in moderation for the pleasure of man and to aid in health. Naturally, drunkenness was viewed as a sin and just generally looked down upon, as it is often even today among many non-religious people as well. But it's only been relatively recently in Christianity that drinking in general has been considered sinful by a relatively high percentage of Jesus' chosen. The change took place primarily due to the increased concern over rampant drunkenness throughout society beginning around the 18th century when mass drunkenness became a major problem largely thanks to the Industrial Revolution. This was both because of the concentration of the uneducated in urban slums and technological advances in the mass production of alcohol making it cheap. And speaking of urban slums, as we outlined in our amazingly interesting Brain Food Show podcast episode, Charles Dickens' Sledgehammer for the Poor Man's Child, as the Industrial Revolution wore on, a typical workday for most factory workers was often in the ballpark of 80 to 100 hours per week, though in Britain at least, thanks to the Factories Act of 1847, women and children were restricted to only having to work 60 hours per week. Lucky them, if a given factory owner cared to actually follow the law on that one, which many didn't because, you know, it was the past. Noteworthy here is that across the pond in the United States, according to a survey done by the federal government in 1890, men working as building tradesmen at the time also averaged about 90 to 100 hours per week of work, with many factory workers following suit. I thought I work a lot. That is brutal. And you're working in a factory, not sitting in a nice office reading things at a camera. On top of that, many of these workplaces weren't exactly safe, as illustrated by a British report of the Children's Employment Commission, which gave detailed accounts of what life was like for a typical child worker at the time. For example, there were stories like teenager Isaac Tipton, who said he started in the coal mines at seven years old, working 12 hours a day, six days a week. Over the course of his duties, he notes he was regularly beaten by the older miners, but he states, I deserved it. There was <laughs> it's fine. seven years old. <laughs> There were also more extreme reports of children being killed or mangled owing to being treated as disposable commodities rather than human beings. For example, it outlines the practice of having children climb into industrial machinery to do things like remove jams, with the report noting cases where removal resulted in the child's death when the machinery started again with them still inside of it and nobody having bothered to turn it off. On top of this, there were accounts of young girls working in garment factories sewing with bleeding fingers for 16 hours per day, six days a week. And let's not even talk about childhood mortality rates, losing a child being something of the norm and rampant diseases, wiping out people of all ages indiscriminately. From all of this, it's perhaps no surprise that many people tended to prefer to spend their days in a half-drunk to fully drunk state just in order to cope. Naturally, humans aren't typically at their best when they're in such a tipsy state, and as a result, the alcoholic beverages themselves tended to get the blame, and as time went on, the blame for many of the issues of society. Thus, the temperance movement was birthed and steadily grew in popularity in certain regions, with some of the Christian persuasion taking it up a notch and proclaiming not just drunkenness, but drinking any alcoholic beverage 
was a sin. Couldn't we have just made working conditions better? Then people might like want to drink less, but instead we have to ban drink. Perfect. This all brings us to the man of the hour, Dr. Thomas Bramwell Welch, a man whose surname you probably recognize from the grape juice brands, but it turns out he was also the first person to ever figure out how to make non-alcoholic wine, aka grape juice, which it turns out, once upon a time, was a rather innovative thing to pull off. So, well, why did he do this? Dr. Welsh was a physician, a dentist, and a Methodist minister in Vineland, New Jersey. At the time, Methodists were strongly opposed to the consumption of alcohol. This made serving wine for communion somewhat hypocritical, a discrepancy that Welch was quick to point out, despite it being doubly hypocritical to be against the consumption of wine, given, you know, the Lord and Saviour himself was explicitly not only an imbiber, but also shared with his friends. However, as for Dr. Welch, his stance on the matter was so strong that he even opposed to touching a container holding wine, a problem since he was the communion steward. The last straw was supposedly when a member of the church turned up at the Welch home on one Sunday evening after partaking in a little too much of the communion wine. Welch was furious at the man's raucous behavior. So, well, what did the doctor do about it? Being something of a jack of all trades, Welch sought to come up with a way to bottle grape juice so that it wouldn't eventually turn into wine. And so it was in 1869 that he pressed juice from Concord grapes, filtered and bottled it in his own kitchen, and then used Louis Pasteur's innovative new technique to kill off all the microorganisms in the liquid via boiling the bottles of grape juice. Thus, there was no yeast left, so there was no fermentation and no alcohol. After successfully preparing the bottles, Dr. Welch delivered it to his church and even advertised it to surrounding churches as well. However, many clergymen were uninterested in Dr. Welch's unfermented wine, some even called serving it heresy. After all, the tradition had long been to drink regular wine in remembrance of Jesus, as it instructed. While the grape juice was similar, it just wasn't exactly the same. Needless to say, the unfermented sacramental wine did not get off to a great start. Welch was forced to set his product on the back burner, although he remained heavily involved in the temperance movement. It wasn't until Welch's son Charles, who was also a dentist, started advertising Welch's in the 1890s that it became a thing. At the time, Thomas Welch's advice to Charles was the same as what so many parents tell their children when the youngsters are pursuing a new career path that the parents don't necessarily think has much of a future. To quote Thomas's advice to his son, Now don't think I'm trying to discourage you pushing your grape juice. It is right for you to do so, so far as you can, without interfering with your profession and your health. However, thanks to the huge popularity of the temperance movement at this time, Charles's profession was about to change. Important to note here is that even those among the drinking populace at this point were beginning to jump on board the alcohol is a major societal ill bandwagon, despite their own partaking. As Will Rogers would sum up a couple of decades later when discussing prohibition, the South is dry and will vote dry. That is, everybody sober enough to stagger to the polls. Okay, so let's get back to grape juice. Its appearance at the World's Fair in Chicago didn't hurt either, with many thousands of people able to sample the relatively new beverage for the first time in 1893. Things grew from there, and in 1896, Welch's fruit juice company became too big for one family to handle. To help meet demand, Charles packed up and moved the company to a factory in New York, where he continued to grow the business. Welch's soon became the natural drink substitute for wine. After all, it was made from the same fruit and suited the taste of the temperance society. In 1913, Secretary of State William Jennings Bryan hosted a dinner for the visiting British ambassador, and while it was traditional to serve wine, Bryan decided to serve Welch's instead, further helping to popularize it. An even bigger boost happened that same year when alcohol was banned on U.S. Navy ships and Welch's grape juice was served instead in the sailors' rations. From there, Welch expanded to a product known as Grapelade, simply Grape Jam, which the company managed to convince the U.S. Army to put in soldiers' rations during World War I. Incidentally, this was also integral to popularizing the newly created peanut butter and jelly sandwich, as we'll get to in a moment in the bonus facts, so don't go anywhere. Today, of course, Welch's is a household name reportedly raking in nearly half a billion dollars every year and has since moved their headquarters to Concord, Massachusetts, where they grow cuttings from the original Concord grapevine used. Not bad for some Something that started out as the result of a pet peeve of one man who simply wanted to provide a way for people to take communion without alcohol crossing their lips. 
And now for some bonus facts. Speaking of the PB&J sandwich, while the basic ingredients of it have been around for centuries, yes, even peanut butter, it wouldn't be until the early 20th century that someone got the bright idea to put them all together. This is likely because while peanut butter had been around for some time, it wasn't really popularized until that same 1893 World's Fair that saw grape juice's ascension. So it's perhaps not too surprising that the first known reference to a PB&J sandwich didn't occur until 1901, with this first mentioned in the Boston Cooking School magazine of culinary science and domestic economics, written by Julia Davis Chandler, which states, For variety, someday try making little sandwiches or bread fingers of three very thin layers of bread and two of filling, one of peanut paste, whatever brand you prefer, and currant or crab apple jelly for the other. At that point, however, peanut butter was still considered a high-end food, and peanut butter and jelly sandwiches were not a commonly eaten food item. And indeed, fun fact, this is so little of a thing in the UK, I have never had a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And I don't have a particular desire to try one either. Sounds weird. Peanut butter being more available to the masses occurred in the 1920s and 1930s, shortly after grape allayed had become popular as previously noted. Also critical here is that pre-sliced bread had recently become a thing, such a revolution that it inspired the expression, the best thing since pre-sliced bread. It was around this point that another major PB&J breakthrough happened. Commercial brands of ultra-creamy peanut butter were developed, such as Skippy and Peter Pan, which made for easy spreading on bread. With the Great Depression, peanut butter on bread became a staple in many American households because it provided a hearty, filling meal with a cheaper-than-meat substitute for protein. No doubt, some at this point were happily creating PB&J sandwiches, but the real surge in popularity, well, that was yet to come. So this brings us to World War II. Yep. Indeed, we have the Nazis to thank for PB&J being a staple. Grapelade's popularity with the troops paved the way for jelly to be included in the soldiers' rations during this war as well. However, this time, along with the jelly, was the trusty high-protein peanut butter that had proved so useful during the Great Depression, and of course, pre-sliced bread. A perfect, apparently delicious storm, the soldiers quite literally put two and two together and popularized the PB&J sandwich in the process. So, well, I guess, thank you, Hitler. Naturally, when soldiers arrived home from the war, peanut butter and jelly sales skyrocketed. It was an instant hit with just about everyone. Kids loved how good it tasted, parents loved how easy it was to make, and college students liked it because it was cheap. And the rest, as they say, is history. And speaking of history and grapes, ever wonder how they made raisins before the advent of seedless grapes? Well, wonder no more! For starters, a type of tiny seedless grape used to make raisins, currants, have been around since at least 75 AD when Pliny the Elder wrote about them. This variety originated in Corinth, Greece, hence the name currant, a mispronunciation of Corinth. In fact, fast forwarding to 1836, and currants were the principal Greek export. Of course, seeded varieties of grapes were also used to make raisins, as often seedless grapes are more expensive. As such, varieties like Muscat grapes, which were the bumper crop in Malaga and Valencia, were hugely popular for making raisins. These grapes were big and fruity with large seeds to match. So how did people use these seeded grapes for raisins? Well, that was by popping the seeds out through the grape skin first. This had the side benefit and drawback of bringing the fruit's sugar to the surface during the process. As to the exact methods, as these sort of raisins tended to transport poorly, people often did the seed popping and raisin making themselves to reduce expense. There were several methods employed to get that tedious job done. One method was to heat the grapes in water to plump them up and soften the skin before cutting them open and de-seeding by hand, which doesn't sound like much fun. As such, there were also kitchen gadgets for de-seeding grapes. For instance, one popular model worked by first having the cook feed the grapes into the hopper at the top of the device. As the handle was cranked, the grapes were forced through two teethed rollers which exposed the seeds and forced them out of one shoot and the future raisin out another. As you might imagine, even with the help of this little machine, making raisins was still a fairly tedious process. But this would all change when Muscat grapes lost their spot as the go-to raisin grape in the seedless grape variety. In the 1870s, just a decade or so after the first successful current vineyard had been established in America, a vineyard owner named William Thompson imported a different type of seedless grape cutting that he'd purchased from Almira and Barry, a nursery in New York, which he ultimately called Thompson Seedless. He gave some cuttings away to a neighbor, John Onstart, who realized these so-called new grapes had great commercial potential. Being tasty table grapes, good for winemaking, and also having the necessary attributes to make good raisins. They ripen relatively early, are decent sized, have high sugar content, transport well, and of course, 
are seedless. Thompson seedless, which later were determined to be simply Sultanina grapes commonly grown before this in Asia Minor, among other places, were soon the cornerstone of California's lucrative grape industry, with over two million cuttings of the plant being purchased by growers all over California within 20 years of Thompson planting that first cutting. Today, these grapes are used in over half of the raisins produced globally, around 90% of which grown in California. As a result of the Thompson variety popping up and being grown en masse, helping to make the seedless grapes and raisins more affordable, today Muscat raisins are typically as hard to find in your local supermarket as rotary phones. But Muscats are still prized by some as making for tastier raisins than any available seedless grape. Also, relatively recently, a seedless variety of the Muscat has been developed, so it may enjoy a resurgence in popularity. And I really hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Also, please do support this show by supporting our fantastic sponsor, Bright Sellers, who I'm linking to below. And thank you for watching.